Good morning. I've been asked to, uh, Richard asked me to preach on the third letter of John. Can I have a show of hands who's actually read that letter? Come on, spiritual giants. I didn't even know it was in the back page of the Bible. And uh, two things you need to be aware of, uh, I thought it was an interesting comparison, that third John is actually the shortest letter in the Bible. It literally has only 330 words. And uh, Abraham Lincoln's Gettysburg Address is 317 words and took him four minutes to, to speak it. I just need you to be aware of two things. One, I'm too short to be Abraham Lincoln. And secondly, I'm going to be longer than four minutes. <laughs> Rich has told me to get it done within an hour. No, he didn't. <laughs> Anyway, um, let's read the passage itself. Thank you. Third letter of John. From the, elder to, from the elder to Gaius, my dear brother, whom I love in the truth. Dear friend, I pray that you may, all may go well with you, and that you may be in good health, just as it is well with your soul. For I rejoice greatly when the brothers came to me and testified of your faithfulness to the truth, just as you were living according to the truth. I have no greater joy than this, to hear that my children are living according to the truth. Dear friends, you demonstrate faithfulness by whatever you do for your brothers, even though they were strangers. They have testified to your love before the church you will do well to send them on their way in a manner worthy of God. For they have gone forth on the behalf of the name, accepting nothing from the pagans. Therefore, we ought to support such people so that we become co-workers in cooperation with the truth. I wrote something to the church, but Diotrephes, who loves to be first among them, does not acknowledge us. Therefore, if I come, I will call attention to the deeds he is doing and bringing unjustified charges against us with evil words. And not being content with that, he not only refuses to welcome the brothers himself, but hinders the people who want to do so and throws them out of the church. Dear friends, do not imitate what is bad, but what is good. The one who does good is of God. The one who does what is bad has not seen God. Demetrius has been testified to you all, even by the truth itself. We testify to him, and you know that our testimony is true. I have many things to write to you, but I do not wish to write to you with pen and ink. But I hope to see you right away, and we will speak face to face. Peace be with you. The friends here greet you. Greet the friends there by name. It's an amazing little letter, but this morning I want to look at uh, the contents of this letter through the eyes of John's relationships with each of the three people mentioned in the letter, Gaius, Diotrephes, and Demetrius. And given that the focus of the letter was around these three men, our exegesis, should also revolve around them. First, I want to do a bit of background, briefly dealing with the authorship of the three letters. And to put it simply, most traditionally accepted authors of the letters is the same author that wrote the Gospel of John, and uh, which was John the Apostle. And over time, that's been challenged by people like Richard Buckham and several other guys back in the 19th century. But to put it simply, there's a large and it appears to be a vast number of stylistic similarities between John's Gospel and the Johnanian letters, and that's undeniable, and coupled with an inconsistency of internal and external support and evidence, one must be convinced that the best candidate for the authorship of the letters is John, the Apostle. The dating of the Gospel was predominantly around the mid, early to mid-90s. The first letters uh, in First John, the three letters are all are like one message and one on top of the other. 
And the first John, uh, someone would have spoken to you about this previously, was writing to a number of churches around Ephesus in an attempt to combat heretical misinterpretation of the gospel. John's main concern was around a number of false teachers who were trying to introduce a new type of salvation. They were teaching that possession of the Spirit was not enough, that there was only those who were truly enlightened could have true knowledge of God, and unfortunately their teaching did away with the basic tenets of Christian revelation and centered on the, per that centered on the person of Jesus, thus destroying all hope of anyone ever obtaining salvation. And it's possible that the teachers that you read in 2 John are those teachers that left that church when John notes it in verse, uh, chapter 2, verse 19. The second and third John, both letters were con concerned visits of itinerant teachers in a very, in a different manner in which they're dealt with. In the second uh, John, the recipients are warned not to give, be given hospitality because they didn't proclaim any sound doctrine. While third John, the opposite was encouraged. In the church that was, that was supposed to keep supporting true teachers and the gospel and people like Gaius who showed generous acts of hospitality. And it's unfortunate that it appears that probably the rest of the church or most of the church didn't follow Gaius's example. The true control of the congregation seemed to be in the hands of a per person named Diotrephes, who had a dominant personality and probably one around whom the false teachers associated. Now while John Stott rightly believes that the second and third letters should be read together, if one is to gain a balanced understanding of the duties and the limits to Christian hospitality, C.H. Lansky provides us with an attractive idea that surmises that the two letters were written on the same day and sent to the same church. The second, one was, the second John was to the congregation and the third one was to one of its members, this, in this case, Gaius. If we're looking at the uh, verses one to four, the letter begins from the elder, that's an interesting little phrase from the elder. And in the Greek, there's a thing called an article. And it's, the article's attached to the word the. And it makes a significant difference to the word elder. It modifies it. And you would understand it if I said in the beginning, as John says in John 1, in the beginning was the word. We know the word is Jesus. Well, here, the idea of the elder was very significant. And the elder almost and must mean John the elder himself. And the phrase the elder could unequivocally only belong to one person. And it's significant that it can't be just about one of many other elders. Thus John the apostle wrote a gospel of these three letters being understood as the elder and it brings a higher level of authority to the letter itself, if John the, God, if John the Apostle was writing it, other, you know, than it would otherwise have been. And this is because John was the last and strongest link of the Apostles to the actual physical presence of Jesus. In fact, his Gospel, John was the first of the disciples in the Gospel of John 135 to see Jesus coming, or the first coming of Jesus. And he was at both the death and the resurrection and in chapters 19 and 20 of John's Gospel, and they say, and uh, would also testify to the second coming, which is pointed out in John 21. So the elder, when people said the elder in those days, the people really knew who they were talking about. It wasn't just someone, they knew specifically there was a reference to someone in particular. The letter itself is specifically written to my dear friend Gaius, the church leader that we know little about, Although Gaius was a popular name in the Roman Empire at the time, and I believe it was probably the most popular name. And in fact, it was also used about four times in the New Testament. Uh, however, there's, people are not sure that any of those four references refer to this particular Gaius. So any speculation concerning the identity of this Gaius mentioned here, we can only determine from what God, John tells us in his gospel, in his letter, I should say. John is very open about his brotherly love for Ga and care for Gaius. Four times he refers to him as my dear brother and my dear friend, which you, you'll see in verses 1, 2, and 5, 
and a living. John's brotherly love for Gaius is clearly in view with the use of his language, who I love in the truth, pointing to their mutual love that existed and continued to flourish in Jesus. In the three letters, we should be carefully note that the idea of love and truth are significant, not just passing comments. For John, love and truth is instructive and essential to our lives together in Christ. For John, all human love starts and begins with God, and our life of love must find its ultimate grounding in that love of God. Moreover, the participation we have in the love of God creates the grounds for our Christian relationships. And the love that creates the, uh, both uh, a life of sharing and a life of giving. And again, I must em emphasize that love of God is not an option, it's a necessity. A foundation to the very life that we together have and the existence of the church. To paraphrase C.K. Chesterton, if we don't love God, we will love something else. And there's a list I started to write down, it was lengthy. That would include fame, wealth, power, sex, food, alcohol, other drugs, parents, spouse, children, work, recreation, television, and possessions, even friends, religion, and Christian service. Friends, I believe that whatever you can't live without, that's your God. Concerning the word truth, John repeatedly uses it in the first four verses. We have the truth already mentioned in verse 1. Again in verse 3, the brothers testified to guys his faithfulness to the truth. And the phrase used twice, living according to the truth in verses 3 and 4. And again, the emphasis on truth can't be overstated. You're going to love this. One of my pet hates, and you've probably all heard it, if you watched um, Meghan Markle's interview with Oprah Winfrey, which was just a blockbuster, the, uh, she made this comment, tell me your truth. I hate that. Absolutely hate it. And it's common to hear people say, tell me your truth, as opposed to someone else's truth. Some people would even argue that truth doesn't matter. Friends, we, are, we live in a time where many people in this postmodern world do not believe in objective truth. The world today holds that there's only subjective truths and they compete, they compete with one another. In other words, there's no absolutes and they're absolutely sure about it. The problem with this lie is it destroys the lives of people and keeps them from finding God. Charles Colson, and it's an indictment on the church as well, states about the church, there is a growing mindset in the church that says the important thing about religion is how it makes us feel and not whether it's true. In fact, questions about truth claims are considered impolite, uncivil, and even intolerant. If a particular belief makes a person happy, who are we to judge? As Christians, we need to help people understand that Christianity is not a matter of sentiment, it's a matter of truth. When Pilate asked Jesus, what is truth? Pilate made two mistakes. First, truth was standing right in front of him and he didn't see it. And secondly, truth is not a what, it's a who. And the truth is, it's realized in Jesus Christ. Jesus is the truth. In that he is the reality through which Christian experience and participation in God exist. Jesus is the embodiment and self-revelation of God and the standard of what is real in the world and what truth about God is. Jesus said, everyone who hears my voice is from the truth. John, friends, John proclaimed the truth to Gaius and Gaius responded. And it's highly possible in verse four, uh, in verse four I think it is, where he talks about little children, could be a reference to the fact that John led Gaius to the Lord at some time. What underpins John's testimony for Gaius was the reports that he received about Gaius's faithfulness to the truth and love towards other believers. In particular, Gaius was a person whose love for God was made manifest through his acts of hospitality towards true itinerant teachers. The emphasis was not on his verbal confession 
but his practice actions. In other words, it wasn't about what he said, it was about what he did. Hospitality in the early church was considered the essence of Christian conduct. And itinerant teachers would expect such accommodations if they visited a town and within a local church and reported back to how they were treated. And, it was, and that was a common practice. And this reporting back was probably how John found out about Gaius's acts of hospitality. It was Jesus himself who introduced the church to a new order of conduct of which hospitality would become very common in the first century. And we see Jesus sending out the 12 disciples and then the 70 and commanding them to accept hospitality and what actions to take if hospitality wasn't given. And we find that in Luke chapter 9 and chapter 10. Jesus himself received hospitality from people like Mary and Martha in John 12 and Zacchaeus in Luke 13. Paul received hospitality from Lydia in Acts 16. And Paul also encourages us and the Lord's people to practice hospitality, which you'll find in Romans 12, verse 13. Thus, the early church hospitality provided an extended family for traveling preachers. It was a support base that they otherwise wouldn't have had. Friends, when, when missionaries go out and we support them in some way, whether it's through prayer, finances, gifts, it really enforces it upon them that they're not there by themselves. John's language shifts in verse 5 for where the attention was past and present, what he had done and what he continues to do, to the future tense where he encourages Gaius in what you will do. And he provides three reasons why Gaius would do well in sending people out in a manner worthy of God. David Jackman believes that there's there could be no better or, better or higher standard of generosity to emulate. The first reason was for the sake of the name. It could only be one name, and that's the name above all other names, which is Jesus. In Acts 5, verse 41, the disciples rejoiced when being whipped for the sake of a name. The early church used the name as a cinnamon for, for Jesus. And the name not only expressed the nature but also the authority and character behind the one who had the name. They would receive no help from pagans. Nothing has changed. Today, missionaries are predominantly supported by the church. And the sad fact is that in Australia today, there's 55,000 different charities, all asking for money and support in some way. But we should, in my opinion, take care of the missionaries that are sent out so that others in the church would support and proclaim the gospel, which brings me to the third point that John was making, so that we may be co-workers together with the truth. We hear we, the word we here is emphatic. John is making the point that hospitality is something that we should do. Or as previously said, as Paul said, practice it. Something that we should practice over and over again. Again, we should note that in supporting missionaries, we're helping God love and truth go out into all the world, a world that's void of love and truth. In verse 9 and 10, Gaius' accommodation, after Gaius' accommodation, I should say, John focuses shifts to condemn an individual named Diotrephes who dominated the local assembly and set his affections on an entirely different set of values to that of the gospel. John's charges against Diotrephes are fairly straightforward. John had sent itinerant teachers to the church with a letter of introduction, which is the way and practice of the day. When someone was sent out, they would always have a letter of introduction from uh, someone who was an authority. But Diotrephes rejected it. And it's believed that that letter that Diotrephes had uh, was not one of the three letters that John writes here, but a separate letter and probably got destroyed over time, or maybe he just threw it in a rubbish bin. But, um, but it had no. But anyway, he didn't recognize John's authority at all, and he actually slandered the apostolic community and refused to show them hospitality. In addition, he prevented other believers from helping them, even to the point of putting believers out of the church. And the interesting part about that is he must have had church authority to do it. Your congregation, a pastor just doesn't chuck a person out of the church. 
the congregation would have to have supported him on it, which tells you something about the congregation that was in trouble. He also prevented other believers from helping him. And then he, you know, he, put, he threw them out of the church, all because he loved first place. David Jackman makes the point in such a church the Holy Spirit would have been dropped out long ago. And uh, we often ask the diatrophist type people, did he exist? Back in uh, 1985, I lived in a town called Hamilton in Victoria. I was the manager of my company and they'd sent me to that wonderful little place. And uh, being a city boy, it was just a thrill to go and live with amongst 26 million sheep. And, uh, but I went to this particular local church and it had a wonderful pastor and his family. And this pastor, over the three years he'd been there, started off with a congregation of 20 and within three years he had it to about 150, slightly above. Um, pastor's still a good friend of mine, but the pastor decided that he had to move on and go and do his doctorate, uh, which he got permission to leave the church. And so the church brought in a cellar guy. And uh, this guy was a real piece of work. And he, he uh, within six months, six months, he took the congregation from 150 back to 20. And it was wholly and solely his approach. I was in his house one day and he said to me, what do you think about ABC? And I said, well, personally, I don't agree with it. He said, well, it's my way of the highway. So I went to the Baptist church. Yeah, as all good Christians should do. <laughs> no, it's a wonderful church. Don't go to the Baptist church. And, um, but it shows that people like, and that pastor was eventually pulled out of that church, but the damage was done. And it only took him six months to destroy a work that had taken three years to get it where it was at. And also the reputation in the town of the church was shot to pieces as well. So, you know, these people do exist. But Diotrephes, in this particular letter, it could be argued, uh, was void of love and truth. And probably, if we assume that the what... Uh, Lenski says that the letter actually was sent to a particular church at the same time, then it's, good, it's possible that uh, Diotrephes' underlying problems were doctrinal. And uh, he'd been influenced by false teachers. And although I admit there's, a, there's a, in looking at all the books, and believe me, I didn't know there were so many books on 3rd John, you'd be surprised. And uh, there's no shortage of speculation on what his motives were. Diotrephes' nature was not only in contrast to Gaius, he rejected John, the truth of John's testimony and the witness of Jesus as Lord over his church because he wanted to be f first in the church. In fact, some of the behavior was seen as blatant contradiction of Jesus' own words. Whoever wants to be first among you must be your slave in Matthew 20, 27. Also, the opposite of the nature of Christ, who is being the very nature God did not consider himself e equal with, God, something to be grasped, but he made himself nothing and took on the nature of a servant, the total opposite of what this diatrophist guy was doing. Thus, false teaching always leads to false attitudes, which always leads to false living, and you end up with a particular type of destiny that you don't want to have when you meet God on the last day. His attitude and actions were seen of one in arrogance. However, I mentioned this to Richard, and he kind of cringed. I don't believe this guy was a Christian. <laughs> and, uh, and his life attitude reinforced it. And John gives us a hint in, in one of the parts when he says, the one who does good is of God. And we know that's Ga Gaius. And the one who does what is bad has not seen God. It's not seen God. Seeing God is something that's significantly important in the Gospels. Here, John is linking the quality of good and evil with individual relationships to Christ, individuals' relationships to Christ, or the lack of it. John's words, have not seen God, demonstrates the lack of Christ-likeness in Diotrephes' character. I believe that Diotrephes, like many people in the world today, don't have regard for God. None at all. He was not in his purview. He didn't recognize him in any particular shape, form, or design. 
So let me, let me explain what I mean, why I think what I think. If you look at John 15, 1 and 2, where Jesus says, I am the true vine and my father is the gardener. And he cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every other branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, so that it will be even more fruitful. Most sermons you hear in this passage focus on fruitfulness. But I think we should focus on the branch that doesn't bear any fruit. And what's wrong with it? A fruitless branch is a dead branch. You cut it off, you throw it in the fire. And where there's no life, there's no union, even if there's an attachment to the church or to Jesus. In John 6, 66, it states, from this time, many of the disciples turned, his back, turned their backs and no longer followed him, that being Jesus. The text seems to have in view that some, there is some kind of connection to Jesus, but the departure exposes their true condition. In 2 John, the second letter of John, verse 9, we see others who have left their association with Jesus. To me, diatrophes is like many people in the church today who are driven by motives and self-interest and position. They have an attachment of sorts to the church, and yet they have no union with Christ. The one that does bad has not seen God. I'll give you examples of that. I sat in a church for 18 months and wasn't a Christian. Yeah, 18 months. I think I was there because there was a particular girl I liked. And uh, maybe that was God's way of keeping me there. There was a stunning blonde called Annette Rogers. Now, I married another Rogers who's a stunning blonde. But, um, but you also get the people who turn up for Easter and Christmas. And you never see them for the other 50 weeks of the year. Or people who come to church on Sunday and then Monday to Saturday, they act like God doesn't exist. These are people who have some form of attachment, and that attachment can be anything. Oh, I'm a little one at the church. I'm a really good person. My mum was absolutely convinced that she was a Christian because she was a good person. She went to church occasionally, so that made it even better. And, um, but I, I honestly think that you can have an attachment to the church, but if you don't have Christ in your heart, you're a dead branch. Simple as that. In a more positive note, John adds his own testimony to the comment commendation of Demetrius who he presents as a believer whose conduct is impeccable which is a stark contrast to the reprehensible conduct that we see in the Diotrephes and as we've noted it's apparent that there's two separate groups of missionaries moving around the churches there are those teaching false doctrine who in 2nd John were told not to give hospitality to and there are those who have gone out for the sake of the name such as Demetrius who deserves hospitality and probably went to Gaius with this particular letter because he, speculation is that he might have gone to Diotrephes and Diotrephes said, on your bike, well, we're not keeping you here, get lost. And, um, and while Gaius was one who walked in the truth, in a similar manner, Demetrius was one who loved the truth and had a good report of all who knew him. Love the truth was another way of saying his walk with God was self-evident to all who met him. In other words, Demetrius de demonstrated consistency and integrity with his walk with God. I really wish my particular life would have such a testimony when people would look at me and say, boy, he's something different about him. Sadly, I always fall short of the glory of God and uh, but it's a, it's a, it would be something special. I, I've met people in my life. Uh, my pastor who led me to the Lord was one such person. And uh, he was an amazing man of God. And basically, believe it or not, I became a Christian because of his character. He was a guy who actually practiced what he preached. And, uh, and that had a powerful influence on my life. And that's the type of guy that this Demetrius is. He's a guy that will change people's life just because by the way he lives his life. It's interesting to note that though John had strong words concerning Diotrephes, he would not leave the church torn apart with unresolved conflicts. 
So he expected Gaius in some way to restore some of the harmony, but if he couldn't, then John uh, would personally come and deal with him. The letter itself ends with a warm personal manner with a familiar Jewish greeting, peace be to you, which was significant to Gaius because he was having all sorts of trouble and was, would have been under anything but peaceful situations. John also asked Gaius to pass on his personal greetings to individuals and by, by name. John's loving care for the church showed that at heart, John was a true shepherd. He loved his people and he wanted to take care of them. And that's the purpose of the letters. John was encouraging the church to stay true to the path that Jesus would have them walk. Hospitality is a relationship with God worked out in our service to one another. It truly is an expression of God's transforming power of grace. John uses words such as love and truth to describe the conduct, the kind of conduct we're to have in God's people in the world that has no regard for God. We have a responsibility to Christians to live according to the truth that we find in the life and ministry of Jesus, to love and care and support those who serve God's people. And if we are to display Christ's likeness to this world, then we need hold, to hold fast to both love and truth and to imitate what is good and hate the bad. 